The labor of John Bridges is all around us. In fact, if John Bridges invested in your life at any point, would you just please raise your hand? Thank the Lord. You are sitting in a church that represents one small piece of the life and legacy of a great man. Apostolic Truth Church was a daughter work of Christian Life Center many years ago. But this is a celebration service. In fact, why don't you just turn to the person next to you and just say that word, celebration. It is the operative word. I have never seen anyone so excited to go to heaven in all of my life. And from my experience, everybody wants to go to heaven, but not today. That's, that's my pastoral experience. But John Bridges could not wait to get to heaven. In fact, I suspect he laid down on his deathbed three days before he had to. Just arms crossed like I'm ready to go. He was so excited about heaven. He was ready for his new purpose. He was ready for his new body. He was ready to embrace his Savior, the Savior he'd preached about for over 50 years. He was ready to go to his great reward. And John Bridges is more alive today than he has ever been. Death has not been extinguished by, for John Bridges. That's right. The light has not been extinguished. It has ushered him to a new and glorious dawn. So celebration is the operative word. And yet, a gracious and godly woman, Sister Bridges, is parting with the physical body of her husband today. She's parting with that physical vessel that she cared for and served Christian Life Center beside for 45 years. And Pastor Bridges' children, Nathan, Pastor Philip Bridges, Sister Mendy, of course, Sister Bonnie and their spouses and all the grandchildren are here today and they are feeling the heavy weight of the earthly absence of their father, their papa. Pastor Bridges' siblings, his in-laws, his nie nieces and nephews are feeling the burden of sorrow. For those who called Pastor Bridges a mentor, pastor, friend, we are praying that God will give comfort to you. And so I think it would be good for us to just pray. Let's just invite God's awesome presence into this celebration service, and let's believe that lives are going to be changed before this service is over with. Would you join me in prayer today? In the name of Jesus Christ, Lord, we love you. We thank you, Lord, for Pastor John Bridges, for his life, for his legacy. Lord, you moved through this man. You gifted this man. And today we recognize that he has gone on to his reward. We pray for your strength and your comfort to be with his family. Bless them. Give them encouragement and strength today. You are the God of all comfort. And we pray for your comfort to be in this place. In Jesus' name, we pray for your glory and your power to be manifested here. And everybody said, Amen. Now, it's time for full disclosure about this service. Now to help me to do this, I need to tell you a very quick story and I don't want Nathan to laugh at me, but I just started hunting, just started Nathan and I know you are the black belt in, in the Fox Valley. And this year, Nathan, I took an online hunter safety course. Okay, stop laughing. The content was very good, but the quizzes at the end of each chapter were hilariously simple. They were fail-proof. The multiple-choice questions had three obvious wrong answers and one right answer. I'm going to give you an example of what one of the questions would look like on the quiz. Now check this out because this is just awesome, the way that they set up these tests. Let's go for it. Here's the question. All right. Nope. We got to go back. So the question was... One of the four foundational principles of firearm safety is, okay, this is the question. One of the four foundational principles of firearm safety is only point your gun at people when the safety is on. <laughs> Keep your gun handy for a quick shot. Drink no more than two beers before hunting. 
Always treat your fi firearm as if it were loaded. Okay? And so it's like, hmm, I wonder what the right answer is. So with that in mind, I'm going to give you a similar multiple choice question about John Bridges. Are you ready for this? Pastor John's Bridges' biggest concern about you was that you voted A, B, you visited Disney World once in your lifetime, C, you went on a low-carb diet, D, that you made it to heaven. What was it? Pastor John Bridges wanted you to go to heaven. That's what this service is all about. Yes. He had one obsession about you. He had one obsession about you. He wanted you to go to heaven. And he wept over many of you countless times. He prayed fervently for many of you countless times. And so Pastor John Bridges really didn't want this service to be about him. He wanted this service to be about you. He wanted to reconnect people he loved to a Savior he loved. And he prayed that his funeral would bring every person who attended back to the loving arms of God. His wish was that every person in this room would be gloriously filled or refilled with the Holy Ghost. So this funeral is just a backdrop for Pastor John Bridges' final sermon. Every prayer that Pastor John Bridges prayed for you is swirling in the service like a mighty tide, preparing to pull you into the deep waters of God's love and his grace. So the final request that John Bridges, uh, from his life to you is this, will you please be open to God in this service? Will you give God's love a chance today? And I want us all to bow our heads right now and pray one more time. Lord Jesus, thank you for John Bridges who had one obsession about my life and everyone else's life, that being their soul, their eternal destination. Thank you for your mercy in my life, Lord. Thank you for being patient with me, Lord. Thank you for loving me when I was unlovable. Thank you, Jesus, that you were there all the time. God, I want to receive whatever you have for my life today. I am willing to surrender my life to you once again. I want my life to be an answer to a godly man's prayer. Help me to overcome the barriers today that have held me back in the past. There is a yes in my spirit for you, Jesus. I ask this in Jesus' name. Would you clap your hands to the Lord? Pastor Bridges wanted us to sing a song that puts an exclamation mark on his resolve to see that we all make it to heaven. It's a congregational song, so let's all stand together and sing what a day that will be.
Look upon his face. Hallelujah, the one who saved me. Hallelujah, when he takes me by the hand and leads me through the promised land. What a day, a glorious day that will be. Is anybody looking forward to that great day? Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. God bless you. You may be seated. Praise the Lord. What a beautiful presence of the Lord here. Thank you, Pastor Bridges, for bringing us together. Thank you, Pastor Bridges, for adopting us into your beautiful family. Praise God. I'll be reading the obituary for Brother Bridges today. John James Bridges of Appleton, Wisconsin, passed away on Monday, November 16, 2020, at the age of 73. After years of declining health, Reverend John Bridges died peacefully with his beloved wife and children by his side. John was born at St. Catherine's Hospital in Kenosha, Wisconsin on February 28, 1947 to John and Betty Wood Bridges. He was the oldest of five children. He graduated in 1965 from Bradford High School in Kenosha and went on to study theology at Texas Bible College. After graduation, John moved back to Wisconsin and became the youth pastor at Apostolic Faith Church in Kenosha, Wisconsin, under Reverend W.V. Barnett. In 1973, he felt the call of God to start a church in Nina, Wisconsin, and after 45 years of pastoring, started four daughter works and bringing numerous souls to Jesus Christ. Reverend John Bridges retired and started attending Apostolic Truth Church here in Appleton, Wisconsin with the pastorship of Pastor Aaron Soto. Pastor John Bridges loved people, praise God, and dedicated his life to introducing people to Jesus Christ. There's nothing more he loved than teaching the Search for Truth Bible study and getting people to dig into the Word of God to find the treasures of the Word of God. Praise God. John was preceded in death by his parents, John Moffat Bridges, Betty June Bridges, his sister Betty Ann Allen, his brother Richard Paul Bridges. He is survived by his wife, Sister Carol Bridges, and his children, John, Nathan, and Lynn Bridges, Philip and Tara Bridges, Melinda and Matt Olson, Bonnie Sue Joy, Markle Johnson, his brother Archie Debbie Bridges, his sister Diane Claymala, and his seven grandchildren, one great grandchild, and many nieces and nephews. Praise God, what a legacy, what a life, praise God. The other night when I was uh, asked by Sister Mindy to uh, be able to read this obituary, I counted it a tremendous blessing to be accepted as part of the family of Jesus Christ and the family of Christian Life Center and the family with my brothers and sisters that are here today. I was down in my basement the other night and I was praying and the Lord gave me something to share with you if you don't mind. Sometimes we may wonder, and talking about ministers and people, saints of God, we may wonder what Jesus saw in us. I wondered the same thing what did Pastor Bridges see in me? I go back to a little story. When I first came to the Nina Church, a couple people became my friend really quickly. Brother Phil Bridges and Sister Mendy Bridges. I remember that we, well, Brother Bridges loved to go out to eat. 
And uh, I don't know which one of them, most likely Brother Phil, invited me to go along out to eat with the family. Well, there's more than family. There's usually people of the church there as well. And uh, what a blessing it was to be able to go and eat with the pastor and with his family. But afterwards, Brother Phil, I think it was, would say, Dad, can we ride home with Steve Dahl? Well, Brother Bridget says, shows a sign of grace again. Yes, Brother Phil and Sister Mindy got to ride home with me. We would sit in the car and we would talk and talk and talk until either mom or dad came out and said, isn't it time to come in now? But this would go on numerous times. We became quite good friends through all of that. I love you too so very, very much. Brother Phil made a huge mistake when he was turning around 16 to 17 years old. I had a 1971 Chevrolet Nova Supersport. And uh, Brother Phil really wanted to buy the car because I had it for sale. And he said, would you take my dad for a ride in that car just to show how cool it is? Big mistake. I took dad for a ride. Phil's in the back seat. Show him how it goes. I can't resist. I, I let I let it go. <laughs> well, needless to say, uh, Pastor Bridges in his wisdom told Brother Phil he could not buy that car. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. <laughs> Little along the way also, uh, kind of what happened is a young man uh, came to our church by the name of Jeff Cornack. And shortly after he was in the church for some time, he was a minister at the Green Bay Correctional Institute. And uh, he went to Brother Bridges and asked Brother Bridges if uh, Steve Dahl could come and teach a Bible study at the Green Bay Reformatory. And so he came to me afterwards and said, Brother Bridges has given me the approval to ask you if you'd come to the Reformatory to teach a Bible study. And my first thought was, oh my, I I've never been in prison. And I thought, wow. So uh, Brother Cornack did not go with me to the prison. I went by myself, walking through those doors, taking my belt off, my shoes off, checking me all out, moving me into a room with a few men and two guards and chaplains. Scared the daylights out of me in many, many ways. Well, needless to say, I came back from it, and Brother Bridges and Brother Jeff Cornack asked, how'd it go? And I said, well, it wasn't bad after you got through those doors. And I said, would you take the ministry over after one time? I did that for six years because of this man that stands before you. Praise God. God blessed me with many men getting filled with the Holy Ghost, baptized in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. And that went on in other prisons. Last story I want to share with you. It was a few years into this at church. We always come to church early to pray in the prayer room. We're praying, and I come out of the prayer room, and Pastor Bridges, as his manner was, he always sat on the back pew in the back of the church with the lights down after, during after prayer. And I go walking by him, and as I walk by him, and he said, Steve, I'd like to see you after church. My first thought was, now what did I do? You know, uh, the song service came on. I don't remember a song. I don't think anything. <laughs> Brother Bridges got up and preached, preached his compassionate heart out as much as he did. I, I don't think I heard a word he said. I'm just thinking about what in the world. I'm examining my head. What in the world does he want to talk to me about? Church gets over, and I feebly go over to his office and open the door, and I said, you, you want to see me? He says, yes, I'd like to see you for a minute. Whew. Anybody feel that? <laughs> I think the Holy Ghost is speaking right now. <laughs> and he said these words, I'd like you to preach for me next Wednesday night. <gasps> Jesus, I just about fainted. It's because of that man, because of his faith in me, believing in me, allowed me to become what I was. If it was not for Pastor Bridges, I would have never went to Oconto. And perhaps if it wasn't for Pastor Bridges, there would be no church in the city of Oconto. And I want to say this on the behalf of everybody that's my friend in Oconto and everyone that comes to my church, everyone that's been baptized in Jesus' name, everyone filled with the Holy Ghost, thank you, Brother Bridges, for believing in me 
and believing in this body of believers that you have. Lord bless you. Lord bless the family. Thank you for letting me be a part of celebrating his wonderful life. Praise the Lord, everyone. Um, it's a privilege and an honor to be here today to uh, speak on Brother Bridges, Brother Bridges' ceremony here today. And he asked that I would read 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 1 through 9. And the scripture reads, And I, brethren, when I came to you, came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you, save Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. And my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power, that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Albeit we speak wisdom among them that are perfect, yet not the wisdom of this world, nor of the princes of this world that came to naught. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom, which God ordained before the world unto our glory, which none of the princes of this world knew. For had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But as it is written, I have not seen, nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. But when I think of Brother Bridges and all that he meant to so many people, when I spoke with him last time on the phone, uh, trying to express my gratitude for all that he's done in my life and in my family's uh, lives. In words, I couldn't express exactly how, how important he was to all of us. Of course, he brought us to salvation, uh, sitting in a Bible study with Brother Bridges, and that was his forte, home Bible study. And uh, God only knows how many home Bible studies he taught or how many souls were brought into the kingdom as a result. But many of us in the work of God today have Brother Bridges to thank for his sacrifice and his giving and his love for humanity. And there's one thing Brother Bridges always seemed to display was that he loved people. He loved to be around people. He loved to laugh. He loved to fellowship. Uh, and his capacity to give of himself is something that uh, you still see in very many people. Many times over the years, my wife and I have spoken to Brother Bridges and, and Sister Bridges uh, of their capacity to love people. And they always seem like they always had somebody living with them, living in a room in their basement or a spare bedroom somewhere, people that they hardly even knew, and they would extend the love of God to them and allow them to live with them at risk for their own family and their own children. Uh, they were such an example of God's love. And uh, there's just nothing nothing more you can say about Brother Bridges that he just was a giving, giving person. And uh, I think of the years of things that he did in my life. Uh, one time he took my wife and I, and him and Sister Bridges, we just went on a little retreat somewhere. I don't remember where it was, but it was some sort of resort that we just went to for a couple of days to just recuperate. And things that he would think of like that, personal uh, concerns for people that were uh, in the ministry under her came up under him, uh, and he just always extended himself. Um, my condolences to Sister Bridges uh, and to the family. Um, I can only imagine what it must be like uh, not to have him there with you, uh, such an important part to the family uh, and to the kingdom of God. But you're in my prayers. God bless you, Sister Bridges. God bless you, Nathan, Philip, and Mindy, and Bonnie was a, uh, an adopted daughter there. Again, a, another example of Brother Bridges' love and concern. Uh, what a tremendous man of God. What a tremendous family. God bless all of you. Uh, I wish I was there to, to, to hug you or shake your hand. Uh, just circumstances aren't going to allow that today. God bless you. I hope God's presence stays with you from here to eternity. See you in eternity, if not before. God bless. I love Brother Bridges. I love this family. I wasn't just a part of Christian Life Center or Twin Cities United Pentecostal Church. I was a part of the Bridges family. And that's the way they made you feel when you came to their home. And I hope today that you'll allow me just to share a thought from my past. Before I ever came to God, I was no more than 10 years old. And I wandered into my dad's home office, barely able to see over the edge of the desk. I didn't say anything. I just stood there and I looked at him. 
like any son looks at their father. I admired the man that was sitting there behind that desk. He looked stately and so in control. He seemed to not even notice that I was there. His attention was focused on the paper spread out before him on the desk. Suddenly, without moving, he simply looked up and glanced at me and then suddenly turned and reached for a book that was on the bookshelf behind him. He put the book on the desk and then laid his large, strong hand upon that book. And as he slid it towards me, he said, Son, this is the Bible. I simply stared in awe. He was my hero, my courage, and my strength because he was my dad. He then injected a few words of wisdom into my life. He said, son, if you don't read any other books, read this one. Then he lifted the Bible off the desk, spun around, put it back on the shelf, and went back to work. I will never forget that day. I was a mere child and I had just received the strong message from the man that I deeply admired and looked up to. But I didn't realize that it would be six years later that he'd be taken from me and he'd be gone. And today I honor my daddy. And though I have read many books, I still read the Bible every day. Every day, what wonderful wisdom my dad gave to me. But there was so much more that I needed in my life. So many times I said, my dad was taken from me when I needed him the most. I don't think there's any convenient time. Today I'm faced with another hero that will no longer be with me. I met Brother Bridges when I was 19 years old, lost in a world of confusion and regrets. And as I walked through the doors of Twin Cities United Pentecostal Church in Nina, Wisconsin, Jesus Christ met me at the door. And I didn't realize how much my life was about to change. The countless relationships and blessings that I experienced in that church could never be paid for. But I'll never forget my pastor opening up a Bible study chart and teaching me about the Bible that my dad told me that I should read. It was here that my pastor became that man of influence, and he has been my pastor ever since. I will never forget the one scripture that he placed into my life at a young man in 19 years old. He would teach me so many things and fill the void that was left because of my dad having passed away. Pastor John Bridges would be the one that would teach me what the Bible said such as Psalms 68, 1 through 6. Let God arise. Let his enemies be scattered. Let them also that hate him flee before him. As smoke is driven away, so drive them away. As wax melteth before the fire, so let the wicked perish at the presence of God. But let the righteous be glad. Let them rejoice before God, yea, let them exceedingly rejoice. Sing unto God, sing praises to his name. Extol him that rideth upon the heavens by the name Jah, and rejoice before him. For he is a father of the fatherless, and a judge 
of widows is God in his holy habitation. God setteth the solitary in families. He bringeth out those that are bound with chains, but the rebellious dwell in a dry land. John Bridges taught me that Jesus is the Father to the fatherless. He's the one that protects the widow. And he's the one that I should rejoice and be glad in. Pastor John Bridges was an answer to my prayers. A young man desperately in need of a father figure in his life. And I thank his family today for every moment that you shared him with me. I am forever in your debt. My dad taught me to read the Bible, and I honor him today. Pastor Bridges taught me how to read the Bible, and I honor him today. He taught me how to learn it, how to love it, and how to live it. And I am eternally indebted to a man that I would have been happy to call my father. I am reminded that Pastor Bridges was human. Every time I hear someone say they need to use the washroom. <laughs> when I read of how Jesus healed the ten leopards. I guess they need their spots washed off too. Or when I get into my car and I step on the exhilarator. <laughs> he had a unique word, a way of bringing words across that reminded you that he was human. But in my eyes, he was always my hero. He will forever be a part of me. He is my pastor, my hero, my courage, and my strength. But now I know because of him that I am never alone. God is the father to the fatherless. And he will never leave us. And he will not forsake us. So today, if you've lost a brother, a husband, a father, a friend, and a hero, don't lose heart. Just listen to what was shared with you through who they were. Read the Bible. And don't just read it. Learn it, love it, and live it. At this time, I have been asked to read. The, see, this is what you got. I was just asked to read a poem, so sorry. I dearly love each and every one of you. So many friends and family here. A tribute to his ministry. I've been asked to read a poem that Mindy gave him when she was at Bible school in California. It meant so much to Brother Bridges that he had it framed and hung it in the house so that everybody could read it. And today, we're going to put that poem into the casket with him as he goes to his heavenly home. The poem from Mindy. Dad, I remember the times when you called me your little girl and when you used to hold me tight like I was a precious pearl. The nights when you would tuck me into bed and tell me the story of what Burger Bill said. The times you were sick and I would play nurse. I tried to take care of you and hoped you wouldn't get worse. Nathan and Philip said I take after you, Dad, especially in my height, which I think makes them mad. <laughs> it's the greatest compliment when people say I'm like you. I only wish I could handle things as well as you do. 
When I went away for college, I thought it would be so great. I thought I could handle life, but life handed me, handled me like bait. It seemed problem after problem hit my life's door. I didn't know how to handle them. I was frustrated and tore. Those were the times I remember your loving arms, how you used to hug me and keep me from those harms. Time after time, I wanted to run to your side. You stood so strong and tall. I was proud, and this I did not hide. I used to tell my friends each and every day how awesome you were, Dad, and that I couldn't wait till May. Many of my friends told me it would never be the same. I was gone from home a year now and no longer had my fame. They said you wouldn't look at me as your little girl anymore. The thought of this happening to me, this I did abhor. So, Dad, what I'm trying to say is I'd like to prove them all wrong. I want to be your little girl again. I really wasn't gone that long. No matter how old I get, I want to be your little baby. I'll even fix your favorite cheese popcorn every night. Well, maybe. Dad, there's just one thing that I really want you to know. I love you so very much, and thanks for the seeds you sow. Your teachings and example have meant everything to me, and because of you, like Jesus, is how I want to be. What a tremendous poem, indeed. John and Betty Bridges gave birth to John James Bridges on February 28, 1947, the oldest of five siblings that grew up in a loving Christian home. John started his ministry as a teen under Pastor Barnett in Kenosha, Wisconsin. John, along with his brother Archie, played the saxophone, and they, along with some other young people, created a group called the Gospel Melody Makers and recorded a record. One of the songs on this record was, Everybody Ought to Know. Little did John realize that this would become his passion in life, telling people about Jesus. In 1965, he graduated from Bradford High School. In that summer at camp, he met a young lady named Carol Simons. She had been chosen to come to Wisconsin to help out with home mission churches as part of her tuition for Texas Bible College and to promote the school. John and Carol both attended the college that year where they developed a friendship with another young minister and his wife, John and Darlene Grant. During John's first year at college, John and Carol fell in love, and on September 3, 1966, they were united in marriage. Their first son, John Nathan Bridges, was born on April 5, 1968. John graduated from Texas Bible College two months later. After graduation, they moved back to Kenosha, Wisconsin, where he became the youth pastor and received his ministerial license. Later on, he was elected as the Wisconsin District Youth Secretary. On June 21, 1970, his second son, Philip Andrew Bridges, was born in Kenosha, Wisconsin. They took him to Wisconsin Youth Camp five days later. September 24, 1971, my mother passed away from cancer. John and Carol took guardianship of me, Bonnie Sue Joy Johnson. I am Carol's youngest sister and was only 11 years old at the time. John served as youth secretary for five years. He was then elected as Wisconsin Youth President. Around this time, Pastor Barnett asked him if he wanted to attend a Christmas for Christ banquet. While John was in the office with Pastor Barnett, he gave him a new Bible study that someone was promoting called Search for Truth. He said, John, see what you can do with this. This. So John took it and began to study it. The night of the banquet, Brother William Sisko and Brother Dennis Wickes were putting on a skit. Brother Sisko would hold up a white piece of cardboard with the name of the city on it. Brother Whitkiss, dressed as the devil, would come over and take the name and say, This city is mine. There is no need for a church to be built there. It was entertaining and funny until they put up the sign that read Nina Menash on it. At that moment, laughter became tears, and a burden was given to both John and Carol for this city that did not have a church. In June of 1973, John quit his job 
moved with his pregnant wife, their two boys, and myself to Menasha. God provided us by laying his vision on a businessman's heart named Tom Lewis from Janesville that would ultimately help support our family and his ministry along with Christmas for Christ. John began to pray, knock on doors, and was compelled to put an ad in the paper. It read, I believe you must be baptized in Jesus' name by immersion according to the word of God. If you can show me any other way in the Bible for baptism, I will pay for a trip to the Holy Land. Calls began to come in, and he started teaching Bible studies. August 14, 1973, Melinda Carol Bridges' Mindy Olson was born. Soon after, we held our first church service in our home. We had 13 in attendance, counting Grandma and Grandpa Bridges' dog, Candy. John became an ordained minister, and that same year, he continued teaching Bible studies and having church out of our home. Soon after, we moved the church to a storefront, an old bar. We put up partitions, painted some old electrical spools, got some games, and turned it into a coffee house. Many people came through our doors, and they were all offered a Bible study. We even had our first revival service with a young evangelist and his wife, Brother Anthony and Mickey Mangan. One of the Bridges' first Bible studies was with Norb and Sula Vicka. She invited her friend Chris Kilcheski. Kilcheski. That first Bible study in 1974 included Bev and Aston, Marcy and Darlene Waters, John and Carol were teaching Bible studies every night of the week. Because I was older, it wasn't unusual for me to babysit three to four nights a week so they could teach Search for Truth. It wasn't long before the neighboring pastor, Brother Jack Yance, called up him and asked, What are you doing over there? How are you reaching so many people? John told him about this Bible study called Search for Truth. Years later, Brother Yance was able to promote it at headquarters for the United Pentecostal Church organization. We moved out of the coffee shop and into the upper room in Manasha, where Dan Walber and Joyce Dorn and many others came to know the Lord. In 1977, Reverend Dale Dempsey's wife passed away, and he transferred his family and congregation into ours. We left there and were homeless for a while and had to have church in homes and the boys' brigade. Finally, we found a church home at 640 Twin Oaks Lane, an old veterinary clinic. This later became 670 Ellers Road and eventually 670 Green Bay Road in Nina. We started to have services at the veterinary office, baptizing people in an old horse tank. People still talk about having to break the ice before they got into the water to be baptized. He converted an old stable that was extremely dirty into Sunday school rooms and where the dog kennels were became our sanctuary. Around this time, he was elected as the Section 1 Presbyter for the Wisconsin District Church. On August 3rd, 1977, Marcy Waters gave birth to her daughter, Sarah. And her hospital room was Debbie Van Aston, who had given birth to her daughter, Nikki. Debbie was in a troubled marriage at the time and was desperate. Marcy witnessed to her, developed a relationship and a friendship, and ultimately got her into a Bible study. Debbie invited her mother, Bobby Vandening, to the Bible study, and she invited her sister-in-law, Joni Vandening, and soon the Bridges were teaching a Bible study at their home. Their daughter, Mary Jo, was dating a young man by the name of Mike Schmaltz at the time, and he agreed to attend the Bible study. Soon he was soaking up all he could. He also brought some friends of his, Roger Van Essen and Helen Meyerhofer, to the study. After Mike received the Holy Ghost, Pastor Bridges saw something special in him, and it wasn't long thereafter Mike felt the calling to start a church in Little Shoot. Pastor Bridges agreed, and in 1983, Mike and Penny Schmaltz started in the basement of the Vandening House. Eventually, they built a building in Little Shoot. Years later, that church building was sold, and they moved to its present location on Keston Court, where we stand today. Just like his mentor, Pastor Mike Schmaltz taught multiple Bible studies before his death in 2008, and now Pastor Aaron Soto and his wife Heather continued the legacy. Soon, Reverend Bridges felt it was time to start a Christian school, and it wasn't long before we had our K-12 through grade school up and running with Reverend Dale Dempsey as the principal. In 1983, it was time to expand our building, so the fire department came and did a controlled burn on the old green building. The church members all came together and built a new church building and changed the name from Twin Cities United Pentecostal Church to Christian Life Center. A couple of years later, Pastor Bridges noticed that many saints were driving from Wapaka to come to church. It wasn't long before Bridges, Pastor Bridges saw the need to start a church there. Brother Mike Messer was sent to pastor that daughter work in Wapaka, and it is now pastored by the Abergs. Chris Kilcheski was from the Antico area. The Bridges would drive up there once a week, one hour and 45 minutes one way, to teach a Bible study in a home that only had an outhouse. 
It wasn't long before they started a third daughter work in Elton. In 1985, Scott and Brenda Hughes took over and now it is pastored by Ward A. K. Rabine. Under Pastor Bridges' leadership and guidance, a fourth daughter work was started in Oconto, Wisconsin by Steve and Alice Dahl. Pastor Bridges believed not only in home missions, but supported foreign missions as well. While in a building program, God spoke to him to give the money that the church had saved for a new building to a missionary in Africa. With the church's consent, they gave $30,000 to this missionary, and there is now a church called Christian Life Center there. We could go on and on today telling the victories that happened in the life of Reverend John Bridges. The greatest of those are the churches that stand today and the people that are serving God because of his dedication to the work of God, his love to teach Bible studies, and his desire to mentor young men and to go and start daughter works. There were many young men that sat under his ministry, like Greg Bixby, Scott Drexel, Jeff Kornack, and many others. Last year, I went down memory lane and tried to remember all the people that had come through our doors or had a Bible study taught by the Bridges. I came up with 979 names. During the course of his ministry, he continued to teach multiple Bible studies, including one taught to Greg and Darlene Hoffman and their family. Pastor Bridges was diagnosed with a rare muscle disease that, along with with other health problems, made it challenging for him. On October 28, 2010, his son, Reverend Philip Bridges, was voting in as the pastor of Christian Life Center. They changed the name from Christian Life Center to Cross Point Church. That property was sold in 2019, and the congregation moved to Castleloma Drive in Appleton, where John's legacy continues through his son, Philip, and Tara Bridges' ministry. When Reverend John Bridges retired. He became a member of Apostolic Truth Church under the leadership of Pastor Aaron Soto. The Bridges, and yes, it was both John and Carol that did the Bible studies, have continued to give Bible studies to anyone who would want one during their retirement. He was always adding to his study on his laptop and telling Mark about new things that he had discovered. Over the last few months, as John's health began to fail, every time we visit him, he would say, if I can't teach a Bible study, then I just want to go to heaven. These last few weeks, he has had some confusion, but the one thing that he always treasured was his laptop because he had his search for truth on it. Recently, in that confused state, he left the house, and the only thing he took with him was his beloved Bible study. So have you ever looked around and wondered, how do you grow a church, and where do you start? Churches don't just happen. They begin with a desire, a calling, and a vision. They are built by discipline, discipleship, determination, tears, prayers, and a whole lot of hard work. You love the word and live by its principles. John 21, 17, Peter says, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. Jesus said unto him, feed my sheep. How many lives have been affected by Pastor John Bridges? We will never know until the hereafter. But I know what he would say to all of us today. Everybody ought to know who Jesus is. These are the words penned in a letter from former District Superintendent John Grant. He begins with a greeting, May God bless the Bridges family. Our dear friend is now in the presence of God. No more pain, no more suffering, no more tears. He's free. Praise the Lord, he's free. What an honor it is to come to you by letter and express my appreciation to you concerning my great friend, John Bridges. I already miss him. Brother Bridges and I have been friends for about 52 years. I preached in his church many times. We exchanged pulpits quite a few times. Brother Bridges and I served together on the Wisconsin District Board for a number of years. Sister Bridges and Sister Grant spent a good number of hours waiting on their men. Thank God for their patience. We've been on vacation together from Door County to Hawaii and quite a few other areas. Brother Bridges always insisted on carrying the luggage, renting the cars, and driving to our designation. What a wonderful man he was. We talked to each other almost every day. I would call him one day, he would call me the next. I've already stated, 
And I'll state it again, I miss him already. One day he called me and stated he wanted to go home to be with Jesus. The reason was that he couldn't do anything for Jesus now because of his health. He was praying to get better so he could teach Bible studies and win the lost to the Lord. He stated that his life seemed to be complete because he wasn't getting any better, and he felt maybe he should just go on to be with Jesus. It's been a little more than a month now since he talked to me. He is, however, where he wanted to be, and that is in the arms of Jesus. I felt to tell you that Sister Bridges and I attended Texas Bible College together. She took a youth corps evangelistic trip to Wisconsin after her freshman year and met the man of her life in Kenosha. This was the start of a great relationship. Brother Bridges then enrolled in Texas Bible College. They were later married, and together they have done a wonderful work for God. Sister Bridges and family, your husband and father was a strong man and lived the Christian faith. He's in the arms of Jesus. He has fought a good fight. He has finished his course. He has kept the faith. What a great life he has lived. And I thank you, brother and sister Bridges, for being our friends. If we can ever help you, please call on us. We love you dearly, and may God bless. Brother and sister John Grant. P.S. You know what your dad would desire now? that all of his children would meet him someday in heaven. I am here representing the ministers and the churches from across the state of Wisconsin. Uh, I would like to express on their behalf deepest sympathy to uh, Sister Carol Bridges and to uh, Nathan and to Phil and to Mindy and to Bonnie and to the entire Bridges family. We are so very sorry for your loss and you certainly are in our prayers. Um, I first met Brother John Bridges in 1984 at, uh, uh, it was the summer of 84 at our family camp. And uh, I, he was uh, larger than life, uh, presbyter of Section 1, founding pastor of Christian Life Church in Nina, and I was a 26-year-old rookie pastor. But he reached out to me, and I certainly found that that was his M.O., he would reach out to the new young ministers and try and be a blessing to them. Um, to me, John Bridges was as much a part of Wisconsin as the Green Bay Packers. Um, John Bridges was a leader in the Wisconsin district. He was youth secretary for five years from 1968 to 1973. He was youth president for six years from 1973 to 1979. He was district board member and presbyter of section one from 1979 to 1990, and then another term from 1994 to 2002, which totals 19 years. He was on the camp committee, uh, and he, along with being on the camp committee, he also worked countless hours at the campground. He served on several subcommittees of the district board. Over 30 years of service to the Wisconsin district. And I'm here to say thank you. Thank you, Brother Bridges, but thank you, Brother Bridges family, for your sacrifice, 30 years. I think we should give him a hand and this family a hand for those years of service. Amen. Amen. Brother Bridges was a constant student of the Word of God. Uh, 
outreach and church growth, always teaching home Bible studies, always trying to expand and to learn. Brother Bridges was a friend of the church planner, the smaller church pastor, and the young pastor. Consciously, he would invite them to preach at the church, if not once a month quarterly, some young church planter, some young minister, or a smaller church. He would bring them in. He would uh, put them in a hotel. He would take them to a very nice restaurant, and he would give them a generous honorarium because he did not want them to be forgotten. We honor that here today. Brother Bridges personally blessed our family. I remember a boat ride on uh, Lake Winnebago, uh, taking my son and my daughter tubing. No one could say my name like Brother Bridges. Brother Booker. <laughs> Brother Booker. Uh, our church, we were uh, perhaps struggling is a, a good word to say or a bad word. And uh, Brother Bridges said, is there anything I can do to help? And he came and he ministered at our church some 30 years ago, and he taught principles on stewardship. And those principles that he taught us some 30 years ago, my wife and I have put into practice. And the blessing of the Lord have been upon us because we have followed those principles of stewardship. And I thank the Lord. Of course, they're in the word of the Lord, but it was this man that showed us and our church about that. And because of that, God blessed us. I am forever indebted to this man. I was privileged to see him to go to his home a few weeks before he passed. And when I walked in, he said, Brother Booker, <laughs> I'm ready to go see Jesus. He forever impacted my life. Been in the ministry for several years now. I've tried to preach about Jesus' is coming. I've tried to preach that we need to be ready to go. But here was a man, a man that was ready. I got in the car. I tried to compose myself, but as I was driving back to West Bend, I thought, oh, am I ready to go? Am I ready to go? And so I guess all of us should look, whether we've been in the ministry for many years or we're a visitor here today, I think it's important for all of us to look at our lives and say, are we ready to go? Amen. Um, thank you, Brother Bridges, for being in my life. I represent not just the Wisconsin district, but I represent the United Pentecostal Church. And there is a presentation we would like to make, and our presbyter from Section 1, Brother Dale Pace, is going to help me with this. There are two presentations we'd like to make here today. Um, we'd like to present a flag. This flag being presented to you is the official flag of the United Pentecostal Church International and was flown over world headquarters in Weldon Spring, Missouri, reaching the people of this world with our message is the vision that has drawn us and bound us together. On behalf of the General Superintendent David K. Bernard, the executive board and general board, the officials of the United Pentecostal Church International, and our grateful ministers and saints, please accept this flag and certificate of honor for your family as a symbol of our appreciation for the faithful and dedicated service as a minister of the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ by your loved one, Reverend John Bridges. The scripture says, blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. And the Lord bless thee and keep thee. The Lord make his face shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee. The Lord lift up his countenance upon thee and give thee peace. God bless you. Pastor Bridges had requested that his children not speak at this funeral, but receive. And I wanted to make sure that their voice was heard today. 
had a conversation with Pastor Phil, and he shared with me some thoughts regarding his dad. His first response was, hands down, his love for truth and his knowledge of God's word was the greatest impression upon his life. He inspired many to love God's word. To this day, my father is the greatest soul winner I know and the best Bible study teacher I've witnessed. He knew exactly what to say and when. He made pastoring look easy and unburdensome. He was my inspiration. He was also self-sacrificing. I saw him buy gifts for sons and fathers so that they could heal their troubled relationship. He did many things like this, but most of the time, if not all the time, not letting the recipient know it was done from him. He also personally worked on vehicles of the single women in the church to help them get back on their feet and save them the cost of repairs. My father was a big man, but he also had a very big heart. He was a hero of the faith, and he will be missed. Nathan responded to me. He said, I remember one time getting grounded for a week for being five minutes late for supper. We always ate at five. Dad made me a punctual person. If you're on time, you're late. That's powerful right there. He made the best hamburgers and baked his cheese curds in the oven until they were crispy. Man, Culver's didn't invent that. That's powerful. He was a jack of all trades, repairing or building stuff. It had to be, and he had to be that way because of the salary he lived on when we were growing up. Nate recalls and remembers many times going to the church to practice playing the drums. And my dad would be at the altar in the dark, weeping and sobbing, calling out to God. Mindy, one thing I can remember as a little girl, I used to get jealous when my dad would hold little girls from the church in his arms, love on them, and call them his little girls. I used to think, this is my daddy, not their daddy. <laughs> he explained to me that many of these young kids did not have a dad, and he was trying to show them love because they had no dad to show them love. His passion was teaching Bible studies. He would never tell them that he was the pastor of the church. He would just be a friend and teach them the word of God. A few lessons into the study, the question would always come up, who is the amazing pastor of your church? He would humbly say, I am. They were so amazed that a pastor could be so real, personable, and have so much fun with people. I can remember my dad's alarm going off at 5 in the morning and hearing him get up to go to church and pray. Sometimes I would sneak into the church and listen to him. He would be crying so hard at times he could hardly talk. I could hear him calling out the names of people in the church. He had such a burden for souls. I always knew when my father went to war spiritually because he would come home and tell mom, I'm not going to eat tonight. I'll be in the bedroom. You could hear him crying out to God for direction. I remember when I was sick, my dad would come into my room and pray over me. Then he would say, baby, if I could take this sickness upon myself for you, I would. I was his little girl, so I got lots of snuggle time with my father. One of his favorite things to do was to tell you he had a secret for you. And when he got up close, when you got up close to him, he would whisper in your ear, I love you. There wasn't a day that went by that my dad didn't tell me he loved me. Even on his deathbed when he couldn't talk, he would mouth the words, I love you to me. To the grandkids, he would whisper, Papa loves you. There was no doubt that he loved you because he told you every time he saw you. Sister Bonnie, she itemized the fact, we've heard this a few times, that Brother Bridges loved food. And I know that for a fact. He asked me on several occasions if I'd ever enjoyed Sister Bridges' Rice Krispie Chicken. And I have, in fact. If you ever had a sandwich, Sister Bonnie said, with John, you always had to have Tanuda's Hot Peppers. And I mean hot. He did love his hot peppers. He always made sure I was in stock. He would ask me that regularly. Do you have enough peppers? He would buy them for me. 
John used to make us fried Spam sandwiches after Sunday night services. Health food. Mark and John drove their Midas... Mark and John drove their motorcycles from Milwaukee in the pouring rain and had to stop and buy garbage bags to wear because they didn't have rain gear. During camp, there was always a ball game, the preachers versus the kids, and John was always known for hitting a home run over the girls' dorm. Elder always smoked Mark in racquetball. Sorry, Mark. The story has been told. Well, I'm going to read to you, and I know that we're taking our time in this funeral today, and this isn't one of those days for an impersonal message or sermon or a service. Pastor Bridges is actually delivering this message today. I am reading from him. Again, Pastor Bridges' words. I was sitting here in my living room when my daughter said, Dad, Wouldn't it be cool to video you preaching one last sermon and show it at your funeral? At first, I just looked at her, and then she said, Dad, what would you say if you could have one last chance to talk to everyone? This got me to thinking. I even got a little excited about thinking about it. To be able to preach one last sermon, to be able to share the gospel one last time and the possibility of one more soul coming to Jesus, this would be worth exhausting my energy. We were not successful making the video. However, with the help of my daughter, I was able to get it down on paper. So here it is. My last message. Knowing that you are going to pass away gives you a very different perspective on things around you. It's simply amazing how priorities, goals, problems, and earthly concerns all fall into such a different category when you are faced with the reality of death. I've been asked, are you afraid to die? No, I'm not. I've been working my whole life for this moment. I think it's rather exciting. The thought of seeing my Savior puts a smile on my face and a praise in my heart. My sister-in-law asked me, how do you know for sure that your heart is right with God? That is where faith in God's word comes into play. You simply obey his word. If you have followed the plan of salvation and have been born again, if you have developed an intimate relationship with God, and if you have checked your heart daily to make sure all has been forgiven, he is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You see, we tend to judge ourselves based on the multiple mistakes we have made throughout our entire lives. Looking through that lens, none of us will make it to heaven. However, when we understand the power of his blood and the reason that he came and gave himself at Calvary, when we understand that he refuses to remember those sins that, he, that have already been covered by his blood and refuses to hold them against us, it is then that we stand before him pure, clean, and holy. When we understand that we could never be righteous enough, but he gives us his righteousness. It's not what we do because we can't do anything to earn salvation. It's what he has already done. When we repent of our sins, when we are baptized in Jesus' name by immersion and receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, it's his spirit that leads us and guides us into all truth. This is why communion has been such a special, deep, heart-touching experience for me. What he did on Calvary has given us the opportunity to be clean and to have eternal life. I am ready to see Jesus. At this point, the only thing that is hard for me to do is to leave all of you. I love each of you so much. Indulge me just for a moment to speak directly to my family. One of my wishes today was that none of my immediate family would speak at my funeral, even though I know you would all do an amazing job. Today, I wanted you to be ministered to and not be the ones doing the ministering. This service isn't really for me. It's for you and for all of those who have come to this service. Carol, my beautiful wife, you know that I love you with all my heart. Outside of Jesus Christ, you have been the love of my life. You have been my rock. You have taken care of me all the way to the end in sickness and in health. I can never thank you enough for all that you have done for me. I thank God that I have gone home first because I would not have done well without you. 
I'll be waiting for you on the other side. To my children, I am proud of each of you, and I love you with all my heart. To say what I would like to say to each of you would take too much time, so I've arranged for you to receive something from me at a later time. However, I will say to you, the greatest gift you could ever give me is to make it to heaven with your families. This is all I ever wanted. I don't want this to be goodbye. I want it to be, I'll see you later. To my grandkids, I will miss my time with you. You bring me so much joy. I have so many cherished memories of each of you. Papa only has one request. Make sure you make heaven your home. To my brother, sister, and all my nieces and nephews, I love you so much. We have had such a wonderful family. We have so many wonderful memories. I hope you continue to gather together and make many more memories in the future. But today, I want you to look into your heart and make sure it's ready. I will be looking forward to our family reunion in heaven. To all of you who are here today, I will be very transparent with all of you. My desire is to see you in heaven. But as much as I want this to happen, only you can make that decision. I have no idea who is sitting in these pews right now. But if you are a faithful saint of God, I want to say keep the faith. Keep on keeping on. Take heed to the word that says in the last days there will be great, a great falling away. Take heed that you don't let your lamps run out of oil. Keep Jesus the main thing. Be so close to Jesus that nothing and no one will ever come in between you and him. Maybe you are here and you haven't had that oil in your lamp for quite a long time. Maybe you just got caught up with the cares of this life and put your relationship with God on hold thinking that it would be just a temporary thing. And now you find yourself so far from him that you are not sure how to get back. Let me remind you of the prodigal son. Every, everyone focuses on the son. But can I remind you of the father waiting, watching, and being there ready to run to his son as soon as he saw him. He threw his arms around him, kissed him, and restored him to his position. So what are you waiting for? Come home. Maybe you are here today and you have not been born again of the water and of the spirit. Let me quote to you John 3 and 5. Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of the water and of the spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. And also Acts chapter 2, verses 37 through 39. Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. For the promise is unto you and to your children and to all that are afar off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. Today is the day of salvation. So, in closing, no, I will not say this five more times. I am wrapping it up. He wrote that. I think he would also say, musicians, please come. Could it be that God had a plan for this service? Could it be that he is using this funeral to get your attention? Could it be his way of showing you love and giving you this chance to come to him. I don't want you to wait. I'm giving my last altar call. I want to open these altars. If you feel 
that you want to make a change in your life and commit to putting Jesus Christ first. Make that step today. These altars are open. God does not expect you to be perfect. He expects you to trust him and let him make the difference in your life. I love you, and I will see you on the other side. Will you stand with me? I want to give everybody in this room the opportunity just to talk to the Lord right now. He's here. He's as close as the mention of his name. You don't have to pray the perfect prayer. Just say his name, Jesus. Jesus, I need you. Help me, Jesus. Forgive me, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, for a messenger like John Bridges. Thank you for a man who exampled and modeled, Lord, what true faith Christianity looks like. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, Father, help me right now. Forgive me, Jesus, of every evil word I've ever spoken. Forgive me for every thought that was evil. Forgive me, Jesus, for every person I've ever hurt, for every wrong. For every decision that I made when I knew better, Jesus, I'm sorry. I never stopped loving you, Jesus. I never stopped loving you, Jesus. I just didn't know, Lord, how to recover my life. In the name of Jesus, hallelujah. I wonder if we couldn't just lift our hands in this place. It's a universal sign of surrender. We use it all around the world. Jesus, I surrender to you. Jesus, I surrender to you. Lord, I'm making a decision today, Lord. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Lord, I am determined to manage that decision. Thank you, Jesus, for the word that has been spoken, that has been preached to us today. We are so grateful. In Jesus' name. I need thee, oh. I need thee. I need thee. Come on, somebody, let them know. Bless me now. I feel the power of God in this place right now. Oh, my Savior, I come to Yes, I need you, Jesus. I need you, Jesus. Every hour, I need thee. Oh, bless me now, my Savior. I come to Thee. One more time. One more time. I need Thee. Oh. Yes. Let this be your confession. Let this be the testimony of your life. I'm dependent on you, Jesus. Every hour. I need thee, oh bless me.
me now, my Savior. I come to Thee. Thank you, Lord. Can we lift our voices and praise? I love you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord, that when we step over the threshold, there is hope. When we step into eternity, Lord, there is hope. Thank you, Jesus. I believe the Word of God is so powerful. The Apostle Paul said, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. God is not asking too much for us to present our body to him. It is only reasonable. There's a story in 1 Kings about Adonijah and Joab. Both made horrible mistakes and ran to the tabernacle of the Lord. But there's one difference. One man laid himself upon the altar and the other laid beside the altar. One man was spared from death and the other was not. Can you guess who? It was the man on the altar. Present your body a living sacrifice to the Lord. Brothers and sisters, the time is short. Prophetic completion is upon us. How many billboards do we need to prove to us that God's word is true? What Pastor Bridges taught in prophecy in all of the facets of the world, it is moving towards a prophetic end. We had a messenger and we have the timeless word of God. It is an agreement that the Lord is soon to return. Everybody in this house, you need Jesus. There's nothing in this world worth surrendering your soul for. Set your affections on things above and not on things of this earth. In the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. We're so very grateful for everyone who has been a part of this service. There is a meal to follow. At the Grand Meridian, it's 2621 North Oneida Street. You just drive in this direction on Northland Avenue right here. Drive in that direction. And you go to Oneida Street, Northland Street to Oneida Street, and take an immediate left, and you will see the Grand Meridian. If you have a smartphone, just Google the Grand Meridian. We have enough food for everyone, and we want you to come and be a part. It is time to allow this man to go to his resting place. You may be seated.